This is show four, and we'd like to thank all of the staff and officers here at Local 53 who have been so supportive of our efforts. Becky Charles, Administrative Secretary. Tracy Jackson, Assistant to the Treasurer. Deborah Tashian, Member Services. Angela Schwartz, Assistant Secretary. Tarek Jalio, Executive Coordinator. John Ellerid, Treasurer. And Leroy Jackson, President. Uh, thank you, everybody, and I'd just like to say on behalf of our National Captioning Institute unit of NABIT CWA Local 53, uh, we appreciate the, uh, the efforts that the staff has given to the campaign that we've had with NCI. It's unfortunate that we've had to go through this. However, when a unit's in trouble, we need people to step forward and do the things that have to be done to support these people. They're fighting for their jobs, they're fighting for their incomes, and uh, this office has done everything we could to give them all the support that we can. Thank you. time to be appropriate turn to ourselves let's we'll start with oh my name is Jonathan Peterson I'm an editor at the National Captioning Institute or was and I'm also the co shop, <laughs> co -shop steward along with Leslie you're here I'm Paul Martin I was the operator for 17 and a half years I'm Leslie Gersikoff I was a senior editor at the time of termination I've had the honor of serving on the board of local 53 I'm Daniel Feinberg. I was an editor for four and a half years. Okay. I'm Marsha Radford, and I'm, I was an associate editor. I'm Brian Belyonsky. I was an associate editor. I've been wrongfully terminated because I was uh, injured in the work environment, and they went ahead and terminated me anyway, which is actually illegal. <laughs> Terry Rotifer, I was with the uh, National Caption Institute for 18 years and was elevated to associate editor. Polly Roberts, um, I was a caption editor at NCI for about four years. <coughs> uh, Terry, would you like to explain to people what captioning actually is? Sure, a lot of people don't understand the process and um, I like to think of it as almost like doing a video game. You set your computer up in front of you and you have a lot of problems to solve. What we're going to do is essentially, let's say we're working on a half hour show, which normally is really around 22 minutes, and we have either control with a tape, which we used to have, but more recently with a server that digitally puts the show on the screen in front of you. You have a keyboard here, you have a computer here, and you start running the show about a second to two and a half seconds at a time. You listen to what's being said, you decide where on the screen you want to place the caption which best indicates who is the speaker. Sometimes it's very obvious because that person's on the screen right in front of you, but sometimes that person is off screen somewhere and you need to either identify them or establish where they are by the placement of the caption on the screen and become consistent about this. And as you go through the program, you just listen one or two seconds at a time, type what you hear, try to capture exactly the flavor of that person's personality on the screen and continue on through the show until you've got the whole show captioned. Afterwards, you listen to it, watch it over again so that it replays, catch errors that you may have made in the way of typos or uh, audios that you didn't pick up the first time or you hear corrections for the next time around. And it is like playing a, a, a video game in a way because the things we have to solve are to best indicate what the character's personality is, to capture the audios exactly, and um, the, the problems can be that we get a very bad soundtrack, which sometimes comes from the source that senses the tape. Uh, there may be music playing that for some reason in the mix the music is much louder than the audios, in which case you really can't hear very clearly. And um, the camaraderie that most of us have 
grouped together over the years is having to go to each other to come in and say, listen, I really can't pick up what's being said here. The uh, music is overriding all the dialogue. Can you pick up what this person says here? And we came to each other's rescue hundreds of thousands of times probably over the year. And that's where the camaraderie comes is to kind of help each other do the very best job we can to present the show in its best uh, condition to uh, the viewing audience. And uh, we became very dedicated to being as perfect as possible because we want the audience who sees it to get the very most they can out of it through what we can do for them. And that's what has brought around the camaraderie of this group for the most part. Do you not mention the audience that goes beyond the deaf community? <clears throat> well, yes. Well, some, I'll tell you one of the things I use at home it for, because I watch it all the time at home. Uh, you can do a lot of things at once if you're watching the show, the captions on the show, but not listening to it. The telephone rings, you're watching the show, put it on mute, have the captions running, you talk on the phone, you read the show as it's going by. Uh, I'll let you think of other things. Well, some people use it as, a, as, a, as a English as a second language if they're trying to, oh, right. to study the language. And teachers use it in the classroom teachers. to help people who are learning right. the language. They see on the screen and see what the pronunci they hear the pronunciation and see the writing on the screen to a person who doesn't know English as a first language, that comes as a big help to them to see how this is how this word, like thought, who knows there's a GH in there that you don't hear. But right. on the screen, it's very helpful to see it at the same time. Right. Airports. If you get headsets on, you get like, bored on the treadmill, you can sometimes look at the screen and start reading. Well, they right. Have right. The, <laughs> the gym. The gym. At the airport, they have it on all the time. Right. And Two at a bar. in one bed. So one's asleep, the other can read captions. Right. And, and in terms of stressing the importance of how captioning has become such a part of everyday life, I mean, something that most people are probably not aware of is, is, is that under a congressional act, there is actually an implementation to bring captioning up to a 100% rate for all broadcast programs, you know, and uh, as we were just actually, while we were talking and taking a break, Marsha here, we were even just talking about how it's even now branching off to streaming video on the internet and things like that. I mean, there's, there's no question that this brings a quality of life to a select, you know, group of people in terms of the, the deaf and hard of hearing communities, but clearly it reaches so many other people Yeah, as well. broader and broader audience <laughs> all the time. Yeah. There are many public gathering places such as bars and restaurants where there are television sets up in the corner for people who cannot get away from television, must have it at all times, and you can sit there and have your dinner, and everybody's talking, but up there in the corner is the show with its captions running. Yeah. Yeah. I've been trapped in a conversation before they would kind of escape by looking up at the <laughs> restaurant. <laughs> As Brian, oh, I'm we should also point out that we do sound effects also, because that's right. an important part of you know a movie or television show. When the doorbell right. rings, um, if there's a knock on the door, or if some, if there's a loud thud or a loud sound or. Or siren dog, approaching, right? Yeah. A, or si a siren or a dog barking, or, or even describing music that indicates something ominous is about to happen, and the only thing that indicates that because of what's going on, maybe you're just pushing through bushes, and you can see hands pushing through bushes, but the music is telling you something dreadful is about to happen, right. and that's the only thing that's telling you that. Or something wonderful like the wedding march. Or <laughs> well, but actually, well, but actually even, ta even taking it one step further, I and mean, something that may, many people may not be aware of is, is, is that there are people that, it, that it's, it's that we, when we say the deaf and hard of hearing community, something that, to take what Terry said even one step further, we, we do, captioning also encompasses things like, for example, a show like Soul Train, you know, a music show where people who are hard of hearing but not completely deaf, for example, can enjoy watching the lyrics rolling by but are actually able to, for example, you know, put their hand to a speaker and actually get a sense of the rhythmic beat accompanying the lyrics. So in a sense, that it does give them an outlet to enjoy music that you wouldn't otherwise think was possible. Right. One of the things that Brian had just mentioned um, when he introduced himself was that he was wrongfully terminated because he was he had filed a workers' comp claim, and it is illegal to terminate somebody. Um, Paul also is one of our members that we feel was wrongfully terminated because his work was to archive the shows after they were completed, after production was completed. And I'd like uh, Paul, if you would say a few words about what you believe is happening now to work. 
Well, as far as I understand it, uh, my work has been split up among several other non-union people, uh, and being was being uh, completed in that form. <coughs> um, part of the problem is, is that those people that are not doing my work <coughs> obviously don't have the years of background to answer technical questions that clients would email me constantly uh, and I would have to email back. Um, most people assume that there's only one version of a show when in fact, uh, for example, I've had several different versions of movies and I've had to clarify with my clients which specific version they're looking for. So I can imagine the nightmare that my clients are going through now, since nobody can say, well, what version do you want of that? Um, my other responsibilities that were doled out included um, sending files throughout the world to Australia, New Zealand, Ireland, Scotland, England, and those require special conversions that need to take place as well as I can identify what version of the show is needed for the client. Because uh, like I said, there are several different versions to different movies and uh, series that go on. So I feel for my clients because I don't think that they're getting the, the quality and the expertise that I could give them uh, from the past. Um, what I had to do was a uh, quick and dirty version of training somebody as to how to do my job. Mm -hmm. So along the way, several so things got left out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was about to say, Perhaps. all represents <laughs> the quality of care. <laughs> <laughs> As you heard from Terry, also, we really did care about the job. I mean, it was not just. And, and I would like the accent again. You know, you know, <laughs> Paul Martin, nearly twenty years' experience, couldn't have a nameplate. Thanks, <laughs> That's <Jack>. right. <laughs> he is our senior archivist. <laughs> and I think the job does draw. I think the Holly Nair song, the quote is, "You know, we are kind and gentle people." You're working in an environment where it's a closed office. You've got you, the video, and you're transcribing. So it's very. Well, to use the word Zen-like, you're, you're, you're in a sort of this monastic existence for years and years, and there's not a lot of politics that enter our world because we've got a task, we know how to do it, it's defined parameters, we complete the task, and we leave, which a lot of us had these great lives outside of work because we didn't have to carry a lot of work home. But while you're there, it's very insulated, which is why when the politics started happening, a lot of us were like, you know, uh, like a, a <laughs> almost like gophers in the sunlight or something, because you really didn't have that kind of aggressive individual um, on our end anyway, which is why we thank God for the union, because the yes. union was there to be our guard right. dog for these very gentle people. And that's why you saw a lot of the people when they were threatened just kind of breaking down right in front of you, because they hadn't had a lot of those altercations in the work environment before okay. and no one knew quite how to handle it because suddenly this this sort of sacred space was just shattered and violated in the most awful of ways so I would yeah, like really good people though just really you know, good people and I'd like to tell you what happened to these good people on January 31st we the uh, actually we received a call the day before on the 30th that with a time when we should show up for termination. It just gives me chills to even say the words because it just had echoes of something uh, surreal. And so um, the, myself and Jonathan as the two union reps were scheduled to go first. Big surprise. <laughs> but we showed up with, as you met John Allard, our treasurer, and Leroy Jackson, the president, who came back specifically on the train from a conference in San Diego to spend the day with us as we were terminated. And the company spent two hours trying to block our representation. Three. Three, was it? Yeah, three. It was back and forth between lawyers with the um, emails and with telephone calls. Yeah. And we just